So we began chapter six, which was described as the most interesting tra- chapter, but the least, um, the least critical one for our purposes, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, because it's going to deal with some of the inspirational elements of modern Zionism, um, of religious Zionism. Up until now and after this chapter, we will go back to specifically the halachic basis uh, for the settlement of of Israel at this time. Uh, So we're continuing with a question of redemption. We're now up to uh, our 13th class, and we are on chapter 6, page 52. And you may remember we we were left with a question, right? Rav Sonnenfeld thought that Rav Cook's approach was based solely on mysticism, right? We've mm-hmm. talked about Rav Cook. Rav Cook was an, a remarkable person. He was a poet. He was a mystic, but he was all of his beliefs were based on very, very traditional halachic, uh, solid basis. Right? But Rav Sonnenfeld tended to discount that and say that, well, you know, Rav Cook is a great mystic, but mm-hmm. we don't base halacha on Kabbalah. Right. We base halacha on the Gemara. Right. Um, and so it says here, Rav Sonnenfeld thought that Rav Cook's approach was based solely on mysticism, which we tend to avoid, not halacha. Then <clears throat> to negate such an attitude, we emphasize that one need not read this chapter at all uh, with, with any significance in order to understand the issue at hand. We elaborate on the halakhic foundations of religious Zionism in other chapters of this book, and one can definitely skip this chapter. We do not question God's ways, heaven forbid, even if we cannot fathom why he arranges things as he does. At the same time, however, the quest to understand God's hidden ways can introduce us to a new new and wonderful horizons. So we're going to look at things that are not really what this book is about now. Right? Wouldn't uh, knowing God's hidden ways? Yeah, the, the, he's going to explore the, this question of why uh, the state of Israel came about as it did. Mm-hmm. Um, up until now, we've been looking at the halakhic justification mm-hmm. for the acceptance of the state of Israel as as it was created, right? Many answers have been given to the question posed above, and we will present 10 of them um, in the upcoming pages. Redemption at times of trouble. Reb Eliezer Waldenberg, the Tzitz Eliezer, he lived uh, during the time of the Second World War, um, says in his response, Tzitz Eliezer, first he proves the redemption is possible even when Israel um, and its king fail to keep God's commandments. We've talked about this before, evil kings, Mm -hmm. etc., right? He derives his main proof from the story of King Yeruvim II, who redeemed the Jews even though he did evil in the eyes of God. Scripture explains why he deserves such privilege. For the law, this is a quote from uh, the Kings uh, 2. For the Lord saw that Israel's affliction was very bitter, and there was none surviving and none remaining, and there was no helper for Israel. But the Lord did not speak to erase the name of Israel from under the sun. <clears throat> he saved them by the hand of Yeruvim, the son of Yoash. Right? So Yeruvim was a, a bad person, and he was did evil in the eyes of God, but he, God, rather than punish him, allowed him to save the Jewish people in, in times of war because God chose what tools were available was to make it happen. Was the nation evil as well? Uh, then it, it was mixed. It was mixed at that point. Could it uh, be for the sake of... Uh... This demonstrates... <clears throat> this demonstrates that Hashem does not forsake His people when they are in dire straits. Rather, He redeems them regardless of their spiritual state. Whoever happens to be in charge at the time, even if he is not completely righteous, will be privileged to lead the redemption whether his name is Yeruvim ben Yoash or David ben Gurion. <laughs> Israel's predicament after the, the horrific Holocaust was much worse than it was at the time of Yeruvim ben Yoash, in all respects, material and spiritual. The Jewish nation was at an all-time low. 
the great yeshivas of Europe were destroyed, and many Jews abandoned their faith. The um, I think that the point that the author is making here, which is a very important point, is we read many times in many descriptions, Pasteur, other people, of the eternal nature of the Jew. It seems like the Jew can suffer tremendously, but is indestructible. We actually use the expression of the hard-boiled egg, that the more you cook it, the harder it gets. Usually foods get softer, mm -hmm. but compared to the hard-boiled egg. But it's more than that. It seems that God, in making the choice of the sons of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov as a flag bearer for his plan for history, requires our survival. Regardless of our behavior, we are God's tool to bring about the world that he wants it to be. So consequently, with all the suffering, all the pain, all the mistakes, all the sins that we do, God continues to make sure we at least survive to get to the point that he wants to get to. The establishment of the State of Israel was a material and spiritual salvation for the nation. Thanks to it, Torah learning began to flourish once again, and unprecedented numbers of students now fill countless yeshivas across the land. Eretz Yisrael has become the center of Torah for the Jewish nation for the first time in 2,000 years. Helping the Gedolim build the Torah world anew. The only ones capable of building the state at the time were secular parties. Therefore, they were chosen to lead the way to redemption. And we understand, why, that we understand why it was that the, um, the, the observant community chose, despite the fact that much of its leadership prior to the secular immigration to Israel, much of the um, observant Rabbanim uh, specifically told the people to go and settle the land. And uh, Jews, observant Jews, chose not to do it. For reasons that we've discussed earlier and we will discuss again, Jews who were not observant felt a commitment to put their lives on the line, to leave their, the comfort of their homes, and to settle a Jewish homeland uh, in Eretz Yisrael. Um, and so they did it, right? In spite of the fact that their observant brethren did not. Rev. Waldenberg's formulation is worth reviewing. Why not? Tzitzel Eliezer says, who could assure us and confirm it with a handshake that we were not considered very bitter with none remaining and no helper? After the great dis destruction perpetrated by the enemy of mankind, Hitler, Yamak Shemo, our situation during the Holocaust was certainly no less dire than those in the days of Yerevan. It seems to me that there has never been such a ruthless and widespread genocide since the creation of humanity. This Rev. Waldenberg writes. However, Hashem showed us his loving kindness and did not speak to erase the name of Israel from under the heavens. Therefore, it is not far-fetched to say that we de when we desperately needed an independent state on solid ground like our land, Hashem assisted us in his great mercy through those who held the reins of national leadership all along <clears throat> Uh, through those who held the reins of national leadership all along and were willing and able to do the job. You know, it's very hard. It's very hard to use the word, the words mercy and kindness right in, ti in timing of Holocaust. It's post-Holocaust. Post-Holocaust, right, post-Holocaust. Because while nobody knew what was happening, people might think during Holocaust it's happening only in their village. But when post-Holocaust, looking back and understanding that it was almost completely destroyed, people survive accidentally. Well, you know? no accident. I, mean, I mean, it was a miraculous survival. It's not like it was, oh, listen, you know, 
where was the, the nobody can use the word about mercy mercy that we didn't we didn't destroy no, completely it, it's it, it's not that it's uh, it's not mercy of the holocaust it is a decision to preserve the remnant of the people which by the way is a remnant of the people from earlier destructions of the first and second temple of the of the pogroms of all of the history that we have this remnant was preserved, and I think the author would argue, and I would argue, for this time, for this time when we return to the land, when it flourishes, when we become a power, when we become ready to be a light unto the nations, to have a messianic uh, period. Um, and it was preserved for that purpose. Why I, I am not going to get into the conversation I know, it's uh, just as to why the Holocaust, where was God in the know, Holocaust? I know, but, but um, the, the word of mercy. It's a no win conversation. He's talking about something we have yearned for for 2,000 years. And it is merciful that we got it and that we have it and it is what it is today. That part is merciful. You could argue whether we earned it, you know, with our behavior or with our blood. You can argue those questions. I'm going to choose not to at this time because it will go off the topic that we're on right now. There was nothing merciful about the Holocaust. There were moments of great courage. There were moments of great nobility. But merciful was not something that we witnessed at the Holocaust. I, mm -hmm. I don't want to argue that with you at all. Maybe the reason why Haredim didn't build Israel. Everything is not started with the Haredi war. Because Haredi war, they missed their chance to go to Israel before war. Well, he he is making this point. Is they just missed their chance. Is it and the most of the people who died in Holocaust, it was yeshiva students, it was... It was for no, everybody. It, no, uh, it, it, it was the most of the people who died in Holocaust, religious people. I don't think that's correct. I don't think that's correct. It's actually. not me, don't the, the messenger. The it's Rabbi Beryl Wein. It's not me. The yeshiva is... one of his lectures. Yeah. Because they said not to go. The rabbin said, don't go. Cut it out. Okay. Just don't leave. I, I'm not sure that I'll, I'll be able to. Anyway, let, let's just continue. Okay. Um, um, he did not pay attention to the fact that most of them had failed to observe Torah mitzvahs. He's talking about the ones who settled the land. Why do you involve yourself with the merciful ones hidden matters? Asked Rev. Waldenberg. Primarily, we must fulfill, fulfill our obligation towards God and keep his mitzvahs including the great and lofty mitzvah of ascending to the to and settling the land of Israel, which is equal to all the mitzvot of the Torah, as it says in the Sifrei uh, and the Tosafos. We must also try to motivate, to the best of our abilities, anyone who bears the name Israel in the government and outside it, in cities and in villages, to return to God and his Torah for our own benefit. Fools who sin will eventually suffer the consequences, and Hashem will do whatever is good in, the, in his eyes. That's uh, from the Tzitzelius. <clears throat> who really made it happen? The previous answer asserts that the redemption can also occur through secular Jews. However, Waldenberg cites another answer from response from the Toldus Yaakov that changes our entire perspective. According to this approach... Secular Jews didn't choose to. They had to initiate the redemption because that is the only way we can be sure that Hashem caused it to happen. Got that? No. We got that? No. <laughs> Revoltenberg is giving a, another reason why it happened the way it did. He's saying that this was not a uh, make-do well, the, the Fermis aren't doing it, so the Fries will do it. It wasn't that. Mm -hmm. What Rav Oldenburg said, it had to happen this way. If it didn't happen this way, it wouldn't be believable. Let me continue. Let me continue. 
had great Torah scholars established the state, one could have raised doubts as to whether this is truly the beginning of redemption. One could have argued that the religious Jews longed to return to the land because of its sanctity and because of, of the mitzvot that depend on it. Nothing would have forced us to say that God wanted to create a Jewish state and initiate the ingathering of the exiles. It would mm -hmm. have been Jews doing what they've been saying they want to do for a very long time. Now they're going to do it. Right? It's the idea he, that non-religious people didn't have a free will. They were sent by God. No, quite the opposite. Quite the opposite. Religious Jews, religious Jews, have been telling each other, their children, for generations next year in Jerusalem, that our goal is to live in the land. Now, some people could argue that it became just words and not deeds. Right? But non-religious Jews actually weren't saying that. Many were saying that Worms has become the new Jerusalem, that Paris has become the new Jerusalem. We, many places were mm -hmm. described as the new Jerusalem. That is to say, we can turn our backs on Yerushalayim because where we are, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's in Hamburg or whether it's in, uh, you know, wherever, uh, Jerusalem is an idea, it's not a, a place. Those people who were part of that, part of the Enlightenment, part of the, a world in which they said, you know, we're not, we, we don't buy into next year in Jerusalem. They were the ones, for reasons that we still are trying to understand, who chose to do this. And they definitely chose to do it. They had free choice. They didn't have to do it. They wanted to do it. And they did a great thing. Right? And it shouldn't be lost. Uh, nothing would, uh, would have forced us to say that God created a Jewish state, initiated the encounter. Now, however, it is hard to deny the miraculous nature of these events. Who would have thought that people so removed from Judaism would, get, would, would give so much of themselves to establish a Jewish state? Relatively few people throughout the world leave their countries of origin and settle elsewhere. The difficulties of acclimatizing to a new society, learning a new language, finding work, and deter people from entering the world of the unknown. Until this very day, millions of Jews use this excuse to explain their failure to return to their ancestral homeland. In the case of secular Zionism, however, something happened that defies human logic. Most of the pioneers came from the established families of the diaspora. They weren't people who were being chased out of their homes. They weren't people who were suffering for, for, for grums. They weren't people who couldn't make ends meet. They were from established families. People who were familiar with the local language and deeply rooted in the culture, still tens of thousands of youngsters left everything behind and immigrated to a desolate, swamp-filled, disease-infested land. They lowered their standards of living, survived on meager rations, sacrificed themselves to rejuvenate the land, and invested all of their strength in building the new state. Why did they do this? What motivated them to do such a difficult task? What was so important to them about Judaism that made them willing to dedicate their very lives to the establishment of a Jewish national homeland? Had the pioneers been religious Jews striving to establish a halachic state, reveal God's name in the world, these questions would be superfluous. But what motivated those who were seemingly so detached from uniquely Jewish traits? In what way is this country different from any other country in the world, prompting these Jews to labor so strenuously for its sake? Is national survival by itself a strong enough consideration to inspire people to stand up to such formidable challenges. No nation in history has the wherewithal to achieve what those Zionists achieved. We are forced to say that God's desire burned in their hearts, arousing them to act as they did. In all probability, they themselves may not have recognized on a conscious level their true source of inspiration. 
But the prime mover arranged for things to happen specifically this way. Rev. Waldenberg's idea is astoundingly profound. The anti-Zionists ask, if this is truly the redemption, why are secular Jews leading it? The answer, so that we can be sure that God is orchestrating the entire process. Let us see the answer inside, says Rev. Waldenberg. Not to withhold a good thing, I would like to mention a wonderful idea I saw on this issue in a response in a response of told us Yaakov from Choshen Mishpat. While discussing the virtues of Eretz Yisrael, the fact that a large portion of the laborers and supporters of this cause, cause fail to keep Torah and mitzvahs, the author expresses a lofty idea that deserves special attention. He asserts that had Torah scholars initiated this movement, people would have said that people would have said that they did so because they desire to and yearn for the Holy Land in order to fulfill the mitzvah that depend on it. Then we would have denied that this spirit came from heaven. But now that the initiative came from people whom we never would have thought would advocate such an idea, it must have emanated from God himself. But trust, I think, is because religious Jews, they are not capable to build the built country. And this is historically. Sorry about this. You're making an argument that For they didn't have the years, skills. For many years, Jews, the, the Yeshua and they lived in Israel, and they didn't produce nothing. Hmm. They didn't. Uh, they didn't have a, a, a agriculture. Culture, nothing. They did absolutely nothing. How they lived from the donation. Now, see, it's an interesting point you raise, and I, I, I appreciate the point, but. In fact, in Jews who, um, shtetl Jews, had a society. They had tailors, they had farmers, they had milkmen, they had farmers. But they're not, they, they had to they buy never, food for the people there. They were not allowed to own the land, and this is why they were never farmers, actually. They were, actually, they, they were farmers. They didn't always farm, farm their own land, and there were places where they did own land and farm. Not right. Eastern Europe. Yes, Listen, but I, I think the in Russia, in Shtetl, if you don't have cow, if you don't work on your little piece of earth, mm -hmm. you just die from hunger. Yeah. If you're a Jew who lives in Israel and you fulfill the mitzvah of living in Eretz Israel, so the people from around, the Jews from around the world, they will give you money. No, but this is my point. And you're the, running the, the yeshiva, Jew who some came, kind of yeshiva. The, the Jew who it's came, different. the Jew who came to Eretz Israel was the Jew who had a little piece of land and a cow in Russia. Yeah, That's but who still, he was. But still they lived so he had the skills. They were living in Jerusalem. And and people who, uh, who... How they live? People who came to Israel, who irrigated the land, they actually were hiring people. They were actually learning how to do these things. It's not because they did it back in Europe. Some of them were intellectual. I understand. You know. I understand. Yeah. It's not because they've done it back in, in Europe. I understand. Let's continue. Rob Waldenberg now has a third answer. This one you'll remember, perhaps, from our classes in Josephus. It's an interesting... Um, Rob Waldenberg's third answer, also taken from Tolis Yaakov, is based on a Kabbalistic concept. According to him, some of the pioneers of Eretz Yisrael were reincarnation of the Biryonim. Remember who the Biryonim were? Mm -hmm. Okay, he calls them ruffians, who lived in the Jews in uh, in Jerusalem at the end of the Second Commonwealth. Right. How he knows the, the reincarnation? What? How he knows the reincarnation of those Biryonim? Let's let's listen to what he has to say. In the Agonic section of Tractate Gittin, which describes the destruction of the Second Temple, the Talmud recounts the evil deeds of these zealots. Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai understood that the Temple was slated for destruction, and so he tried to arrange for Jews to surrender and make peace with the Romans. <clears throat> these ruffians, however, prevented the rabbis from coming to terms with the enemy. When the siege over Jerusalem began, the city had enough storehouses of food and supplies to last 21 years. 
With such provisions, the Jews could have held out against the Romans even without a peace treaty and forestalled the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. The zealots, the ruffians, however, the Bionim, wanted to force the Jews to fight, and so they burned all the storehouses, causing thousands to die of starvation. Thus, the Bionim were directly responsible for the famine, which eventually led to the destruction of the temple, the exile, and the death of thousands of Jews. Hashem wants to give every soul an opportunity to rectify his sins. Therefore, he gave the Bionim a chance to help redeem the Jewish people in our generation. At the time of the destruction, they caused thousands to die. In our generation, they were lifesavers for the remnant of the Holocaust. Then they caused the downfall of the Jewish state. Now they sa their sacrifices were, they sacrificed their very lives to build a new state. Rob Waldenberg says, at this point, the author of Toldus Yaakov expresses another lofty idea, which I believe has the ability to resolve many of our questions and doubts. He writes, perhaps they need this ideal, and perhaps Jerusalem must be rebuilt specifically by these people because it is possible that they cause the destruction of Jerusalem, as in Gittin 56a. Therefore, the Supreme King decreed that they rectify their previous wrongdoings, do it says, so that none of us be banished uh, from the world to come. Right. So, what? In both cases, they were viewed as not pious people. Right. One was very destructive of the pious people. The others saved the, the, the nation to a very large degree mm -hmm. by, building, by building Israel. It's like in Israel, many years ago, it was a horrific accident with the school bus. And one of the... The big rabbin, he said, it's because people, they don't keep Shabbos. <laughs> That's the same. Rav Arya Leib Hakohen Kagan. Rav Arya Leib Hakohen Kagan is the son of Yisrael Meir Kagan, the mm -hmm. Chofetz Chaim. Suggested another answer to his illustrious father, the Chofetz Chaim. In his abridged biography of the Chovetz Chaim, Rav Arya Leib recounts a discussion he once had with his father about Zionism. In reference to the fact that most of its founders were non-believers, so said Arya Leib, uh, quoted a verse in Eov, which states that he, a wicked man, may prepare clothing, but the righteous will wear it. This shows that Hashem sometimes grants success to a Russia, a wicked man, so that a tzaddik, a righteous man, can eventually benefit from his work. The Russia toils for his own sake, not knowing that his success is intended for a completely different people. In the end, the tzaddik will come along and reap the benefits of all the Russia's work. Please let me continue. Okay. <laughs> Rabbi Arya Leib wanted to apply this idea to the building of the state and today, and today when, he, when the results are in full view, we can understand what he meant. The modern state of Israel is the easiest place in the world to live a Torah life. Anyone familiar with Jewish life in the diaspora understands this well. Workers in Eretz Israel have the option, according to law, of taking off the intermediary days of Pesach and, and Sukkot. One who strictly observes the Sabbath and insists on wearing a yarmulke to work need not worry about finding employment. Purim, Tisha B'Av, and other minor holidays are observed according to Halacha. There are no problems building a sukkah adjacent to one's house, putting up an Arab, being cautious <laughs> about the prohibition of Hadash, keeping all the laws of Kashrut. One can find a minion for prayer three times a day anywhere in the country, and every city has sufficient number of mikvot for ritual purification. All this is in addition to the fact that one can fulfill the mitzvah of settling the land and all the land-related precepts with very little trouble. Thousands of yeshivas and kolos thrive here with the help of state funds. A vast amount of Torah literature is written and published every year, and rabbinic courts oversee all the matters relating to marriage and divorce. And we understand how Ari Leib came to the conclusion that that's what it was. Zionism's founding fathers did not expect these to be the results of their efforts. They dreamed of a secular state, but in actuality they created a state that serves Judaism at its best. We can compare this to the great architect who designed the magnificent palace, 
the common workers who build the edifice did not understand the architect's intention and goals. They think that they are building a simple apartment complex. Do the builders' thoughts lower the value of the palace? Indeed, when the building is finished, they too will appreciate the value. Similarly, Hashem planned the redemption long ago and is currently bringing it to fruition. The fact that the builders have, have other things in mind when they, when they work does not mar the final product in the slightest. Rabbi Arya Leib's account. I argued with my father and said, why do you involve yourself in a controversy that has enveloped our entire nation, thus discouraging the builders? <clears throat> Generations of people come and go, but the land always remains. The builders may not have lofty intentions, but concerning such matters, it says, he, a wicked man, may prepare clothing, but the righteous will wear it. Perhaps a generation will arise and improve its ways. This is, he was arguing, why, Father, are you disparaging the people who are building the land? Even if they were Shoyim, in the end, what they're doing will be for the good. This was what the son was saying. What did the Chofetz Chaim respond? In response, the Chofetz Chaim told his son that the anti-Zionist proclamations that went out in his name were publicized without his knowledge. Oh. Apparently, this fourth approach is connected to the previous answer. God chose sinners to lay the groundwork for redemption in order to include them in the grand mitzvah. Consequently, this segment of Jewry has a chance to rectify prior misdeeds. We must make one clarification, however. Most of the leaders of religious Zionism did not view the secularists as Rishoyim. Mm -hmm. This is really important. In the simple sense of the word. Rav Cook saw the pioneers as grand but misguided souls, not wicked individuals, God forbid. Hashem brought redemption through them so they, too, could ascend spiritually not just for the sake of the religious. Yeah, you asked us not to, to comment in the beginning. We wanted now to finish it. Because the phrase saying that the, the Russia the toils and Tzadik receives it, an example was Haman and That's uh, Mordechai, right. which is not applicable to Jew, one Jew and another Jew. That's right. That's right. And as you can see, you know, the, the spiritual leader of the religious Zionists did not perceive, you know, we know how many stories of Rav Kuk, right? Was that he understood that they were doing a great mitzvah, mm -hmm. right? And that whatever their failings were, we should su support and try and improve those things, as we should with ourselves as well. But not to view them as any less than ourselves at any point, you know? And, and he worked very hard towards that end, and I think accomplished a great deal. All types of Jews bring the redemption closer. Number five. The Chofetz Chaim proposes his own idea in an essay entitled Tzipita Li Yeshua. At the beginning of the essay, he asks how Mashiach could possibly come in a generation as debased as our own. He answers that the Mashiach must come specifically in such a generation because both religious and irreligious Jews bring the redemption closer through their deeds. Religious Jews expedite the redemption through their good deeds are considered so much greater under the circumstances. That is, under circumstances in which it's a very difficult mm -hmm. world to live in. The religious level uh, of those who remain faithful to tradition despite the widespread fight from religion is much higher than that of people who lived in previous generations. Observant Jews never encountered such formidable challenges as they do in our generation. In the past, two factors forced the Jew to stay religious, the Gentiles from without and the communal what sanctions tradition? from within. What tradition they're keeping? It's not the tradition of Eretz Israel. We're talking about the Chovetz Chaim at home right but now. But we're talking here about they are keeping the religious people in Israel. They are keeping traditions. No, but now we're. You're, what tradition? They are not traditions. As I said, those are traditions. Shtetl. The Chovetz Chaim right now. Well, let's what, let's take one step at a time, right? I understand your point, right? but the Chovetz Chaim actually is talking about those Jews who, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, in the in the face of the Enlightenment, in the face of the power of Reform Jews 
continue to hold on to the traditions of 2,000 years, the commitment to it, not marry out, not choose to leave the faith. Now, that's what we're talking about so far. We're not talking about Eretz Yisrael yet. Okay? We'll come to it. Um, in the past, two factors forced the Jew to stay religious, the Gentiles from with, from without and communal sanctions from within. When the period of emancipation began, however, all barriers crumbled and it became possible to remain Jewish in a secular Jewish community. A Jew who remains faithful today, despite the temptation to go astray, is much more precious in God's eyes than religious Jews were in the past, for the challenges that he faces are that much greater. Therefore, today's religious Jews in particular bring the redemption closer. Secular Jews also expedite the redemption through their deeds. The purpose of exile is to bring the Jewish people back to their Father in heaven. God banished us from the land because of our sins, and exile is supposed to teach us a lesson. However, God is a merciful Father who truly does not want to punish us. Like any father, he only punishes his children if it will help. If the child fails to learn from the punishment, the parents must look for other ways to improve his behavior. The Holy One, blessed be he, does not want to destroy his people, God forbid. Therefore, he forced, uh, so, to, so to say, us to re he is forced to redeem us uh, as soon as possible. As long as the exile had the potential to bring us closer to God, he continued, it continued, its existence was warranted. In recent years, however, the hardships of exile have created an enormous rift between God and his people. The punishment of exile is no longer, merci no longer beneficial for those who have strayed from Torah and mitzvot. It only alienates them more, often severing them from Judaism altogether. In our generation, Hashem has to find some other way of, of bringing us closer to him. That is redemption. Therefore, paradoxically, the deeds of the irreligious expedite the redemption. The Chovetz Chaim concludes that it is obviously preferable to try to expedite redemption through religious deeds. Eliyahu, Eliyahu Dessler explains that a sinful generation has a certain advantage over a righteous one. Religious Jews often suffer from arrogance, thinking that they are the true servants of Hashem. Non-observant Jews, on the other hand, have no such delusions. Therefore, they are more likely to attain higher levels of spirituality in the end. Number six. Regression for the sake of progression. The author of Lech Lecha V'sod HaShavuah explains this phenomenon. Secular Jews initiating the redemption using the idea of Yitchav Lev by Yakutio Yakuta Teitelbaum, the Rebbe of Signet, the grandfather of the previous Satma Rebbe. The Rebbe asks how the spies, who were great tzaddikim and leaders of Israel, fell into such spiritual decline, committing one, to, committing one of the most grievous sins in Jewish history. His answer, when a Jew enters Eretz Yisrael and the degree of spirituality increases, Satan musters all his strength to cause the great spirit to decline. He tries to persuade the person to abandon his mitzvahs uh, before, the, the, before the virtue and sanctity of the land takes root in his soul. The Rebbe writes that many people who immigrate to Eretz Israel testify they experience an immense spiritual decline when they first arrive in the land. He even finds a biblical source suggesting the same thing happened to Abraham Avinu when he first entered the land. The spies sensed the spiritual decline, fell into Satan's trap, and forsook the mitzvah of Yeshuv Haaretz, of settling the land. However, this decline eventually leads to great ascent. Just like certain medicines clean out the body by helping remove unwanted waste, so too a person becomes purer and more capable of absorbing the spiritual benefits of Eretz Yisrael after first experiencing a spiritual low. When the spies became aware of their inclination to spread evil, the evil report about the land, they realized that they were no longer on their original level. And that is exactly what they told the Jewish people 
that whoever comes to the land falls from his previous level. However, they failed to realize that this decline was necessary for their eventual ascent. Hmm? Rabbi Atiyah derives from this that one should not, God forbid, attribute today's spiritual decline to human influences. Rather, it all happened by divine providence so that a great ascent may come in its wake. Pass me the Kleenex. Thank you. Elusive wrappings. Rav Yisachar Shlomo Teichel, you remember he was the one who we read the introduction to his book that he wrote during the furnace of the Holocaust itself. Im Habanam Smicha. Um, cites a deep and comprehensive idea to resolve our query. First, he asks the question that precedes Zionism, one that applies to all Jewish history. Why does God cause things to happen through sinful means? Why did King David have to enter the world via the episode of Yehuda and Tamar? Why did his lofty soul have to emanate from converts and the, the Moabite, and the Moabites of all people? In response to these questions, Reb Teichel quotes a profound idea that he found in the Magi Misharim. The Magi Misharim was um, a malach who came to Rabbi Yosef Karo and taught him, and from this we get the base Yosef. Um, the idea that is found in Magi Misharim by Yosef Karo and Noam Elimelech by Reb, uh, and in Noam Elimelech by Reb Elimelech of Luzhensk. When God wants to bestow a great gift upon the Jewish people, fairness dictates that he give it to them only if they deserve it. If they do not have enough merits which, with which to pay for the gift, they cannot receive it according to strict justice. At the time of Yehuda and Tamar, Peretz's lofty soul had to descend into this world. Had Yehuda been worthy to, of bringing it down legitimately, Peretz would certainly have been conceived in a direct and pure manner. However, the sons of Yaakov lacked sufficient merit. Nevertheless, Hashem wanted to bring this soul into the world. After all, he remembered the kindness of the patriarchs and bringing a redeemer to their children's children for the sake of his name with love. Even if we do not deserve it, God redeems us for the sake of his name, which he associated with our name, and because of his love for the patriarchs. The problem is, when Hashem grants us something that we do not deserve, purely out of loving kindness, many accusers arrive, and the attribute of justice tries to prevent the bestowal taking place. Therefore, God hides it from the accusers. This can be compared to a traveler who wants to bring a very expensive item to a foreign country. If he had enough money to pay the required tax, he has no problem declaring the item, paying, proceeding in a legal, upright manner. If he is penniless, however, he has no choice but to conceal the item and wrap it in a filthy, shabby cloth in the hope that the customs agent will assume that nothing valuable lies within. Similarly, had the children of Israel possessed the merits with which to pay for Peretz's birth, there would have been no need to hide, his, hide the gift. Since they were unworthy, however, God had to bring it to them surreptitiously in a way that no one would have believed redemption could begin. Thus, the accusers did not hinder the process, and Israel's salvation arose and flourished. Using this idea of Teichel Zithel, explains that the leaders of Zionism were, and still are, secular Jews. For close to 2,000 years, the Jewish people did not deserve, and did not deserve the hastened miraculous form of redemption, Akishen, okay? for they did not achieve complete repentance. But then, the predetermined time for redemption arrived, and God wanted the process to begin. 
Had he chosen great Torah scholars to lead the way, all the accusers in heaven would have opposed the process, and they might have even succeeded in annulling it altogether. Therefore, God brought the redemption through secular Jews in order to hide it from the accusers. Indeed, it is so hidden that even some of the greatest rabbis failed to see the light of redemption breaking through the clouds. Thus, the accusers are silent, and the light of redemption grows brighter day by day. Reb Teichel writes, and we're going to finish um, with this page. Reb Teichel writes, I know, my son, I know that you will challenge my position with a formidable refutation. If it is true that the rebuilding of our holy land is a sign of the imminent end of days and the beginning of redemption, how could the majority of builders unfortunately desecrate the Shabbos and commit other sins? They are particularly, they are practically like Gentiles due to their numerous sins. How could the creator of the universe bring the beginning of redemption and assign through them? My beloved son, although your refutation seems formidable, take heed and hear my words. Know, my son, that no one can fathom the deeds of he who is perfect in knowledge. He is the God of the universe, the creator of all. Everything that happens in the world comes from him. His thoughts are profound. Now the Kabbalists explain that when Hashem wants to accomplish a great thing which affects both celestial and earthly beings, he enwraps it in many types of coverings. He even uses unpleasant and ugly means so the accusers will not take notice. For if it would be done openly, the accusers would immediately come to protest and the attribute of justice would hinder the matter. Who of us could survive if God was purely just and not kind as well? Had, had the Orthodox, God-fearing Jews initiated the movement to build the, and cultivate the land, it would have been clear to all that a godly city was to be built. For example, if the initiators were the rebbies of Bel, Shinova, Gura, Munkach, or other tzaddikim of the generation, would it have been possible to escape the attribute of justice and the evil forces whom we have come to who who we have come to obliterate forever, forevermore? The evil forces certainly would have realized that these tzaddikim wanted to accomplish wanted to accomplish by rebuilding the land. The attribute of justice would have immediately ascended to prosecute the Jewish people, and he would have stopped them. That, that's what Reb Teichel says. Do you want to hear what the Maharal says, or should we hold here? It just or you have some thoughts you want to share? Accuser. Let's hold here and listen. What are the accusers in pure, plural? Accusers? Hashem is afraid of accusers? No, Hashem is not afraid of accusers, but... Hashem uh, chooses how to approach, with a din or with mercy. Or a combination of both. Or a combination fact, of both. Right. What is not, the, not notice accusers, accusers, you know. We take accusers very seriously. We, we perceive that there is a heavenly court. Comes in Kippur, it's a very big issue for us. Right? And we, we do what we can to take our judgment out of the hands of the accusers because we know that in the hands of the accusers, and they are not working against God, they're working in the, uh, as officers of the court, that we do not stand perfectly before God. And uh, we depend on God sh showing mercy to us and moving specifically through the sound of Trua. It says God moves from the throne of justice to the throne of mercy at that point. Right? If he did not, then the accusers would carry the day, almost for sure. Accusers, it's a God. No, accusers are servants of God. There is a judge, and there are prosecutors, and there are defenders. God is the judge. But the prosecutors are there to play a very serious role. And they work for the court. They're not independent of God. And they don't know when we blow shofar, when it's a day of before Rosh Hashanah or it's a Rosh Hashanah. And they don't know. They are so smart, but they don't know. They know what God allows them to know. Remember, they do not have free will. Right? Unlike God and ourselves. I want to tell you, 
when these statements are made, when we learn something, it's so childish. You know, it's so, yeah, it's a one it's thing. So not but serious. when we say a statement like this made about something as serious as creation of the land, you know, and the state. In our lives now, it's very hard to accept this. By the way, what he's doing right now is going through many different explanations for why these things came about. So that you, you keep this in mind, to be fair to the author, the author has made the case very, very clearly earlier on that the reason the state was built as a secular state originally right, was because those people who could have done it as a Torah state, chose not to. Mm -hmm. right? And it fell to others. He's looking for deeper explanations for what motivated different people to mm -hmm. do different things. Right? 